Stanfield to find his bio. Okay. So Les worked as a research biologist with the Ministry of Natural Resources for over 30 years, most of that time in Prince Edward County where he lives and plays. For much of his career, he worked on trying to understand the historical factors that caused Atlantic salmon to disappear in Lake Ontario. This work required a deep dive into Ontario's jaded history of alterations to the landscape from development that created a deep appreciation for the intimate relationship between human activity and cumulative environmental impacts. I have to say that Les has been a great friend to Peck Fen and a member for a, a long time. And we've worked on many projects together. He's done many projects with Peck Fen. And I also wanna say that I myself saw a version of this talk about a year and a half ago at a South Shore Joint Initiative um, Symposium. And, and there's a lot of information in it. It's really interesting. So I'm delighted to be able to see it again. Um, Jerry's recording this too. Uh, so it might go up on this SSJI, which is the South Shore Joint Initiative YouTube. And we also will be able to have it available for the membership if they'd like to see it again. So with that, I'd like everybody to please mute their um, microphones there and, um, and then we'll ask Les to share his screen. So I'll mute mine now. And remember to write up any questions you have in the chat section. And meanwhile, I will add those two emails. Okay. All right, let's see if I can do this. With any luck, you're seeing a picture of the South Shore, are you? Does somebody confirm that they are seeing that? Yes, Excellent. we are. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for uh, having me on this. This is a most difficult presentation to give uh, because I'm, I've seen who's in the audience and there are far more experts in the audience than I am on this subject, uh, but hopefully I won't uh, make too many big mistakes and embarrass myself by giving this talk. I, I say that because this is a combination of uh, trying to understand geology and history and a little bit of biodiversity and ecology. And it's a little bit complex, um, but I've only been here 30 years. And as I said, there are people in the audience that have got much more uh, in-depth understanding than what I have of this. But I'll do my best to tell you a bit of a story about my um, development of an understanding of this wonderful place. And of course, there we go. So here's the outline. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the geological history of the South Shore, and particularly Prince Edward County, uh, because it sets the foundation for everything that is on the South Shore. Um, I'll talk a little bit about early human history. They've left uh, quite a mark on uh, the South Shore. Uh, particularly the natives, as well as the Europeans. I, I describe it as chaos ensuing when the Europeans arrive, and hopefully you'll understand why I say that. But there was also a very active area during the 1930s and 60s that had a huge impact on the South Shore. And I'll uh, enlighten you on some of those things. Some you might know, some hopefully will be a bit of a surprise to you. And then there's some really neat stories that have emerged in my development of this understanding and they seem to have started in the 60s. Um, the area of the hippies had an impact on the South Shore, and I'll enlighten you on uh, what I've learned about that. Finally, we'll get around to the current status of the South Shore and where we are going. Uh, and I just want to remind you that sort of my thinking about of all of this is that everything is connected to everything else. Geology is the foundation. Aldo Leopold is my hero. And the Anasnavi uh, philosophy encapsulates that, and I wish I could properly um, articulate that. Okay, so the area I'm going to be focusing on is the South Shore, and it's the, um, this area that is roughly uh, transfigured by South Bay and Port Milford. Um, some people extend it to include Black River. Uh, I won't be doing too much about that. That's around where I live, but the majority of the area I'm going to be talking about it really is the core area of the South Shore. 
Okay, my, there we go. So let's set the stage with a bit of geology. Um, the neat part is that we actually have to go back to Gondwana land or the areas that happened basically up to 178 million years ago when all the continents were part of one supercontinent called Gondwana land. It was situated down below the equator actually and it was stable for quite some time except it was very active. Gondwana land was a time when the plates were beginning to separate. There was a lot of volcanic activity. The plates were starting to move to their, I mean, they're still moving. They've been moving around now for 400 million years. Uh, but at that time, there was uh, basically these small slabs of granite that were surrounded by water and seas that were beginning to be quite productive. Uh, and there was limestone being laid down at different times, underlaid by volcanic ash and silt that basically covered the ocean and slowly started to create this sedimentary rock. And so our Ordovician time, which goes back to 400 and some million years ago, is the time that our rock was formed. When I say our rock, I mean our surface bedrock. So this Gondwana land time was very influential across the entire world. Uh, it was a time when biodiversity was quite um, minor. It was all aquatic, basically. We were, it was dominated by snails and corals, some trilobites, but they were just starting to get their handle. Um, but it was, it created a lot of rock over a long period of time. Over time, as the rocks and the plates moved through plate tectonics, they tilted and fractured. And I mean, I've gone through 400 million years to get to the stage to show you what we currently have. At one time, I'm sure that we had younger sedimentary rock on top of ours that wasn't quite as hard as our Ordovician limestone and was scraped off. But what we end up with, <clears throat> somebody's not muted. That's okay. Um, can you guys hear me okay? It's okay now. It's great, Les. Okay, great. So a couple of interesting things happen. So we're basically where we are. There's one small still igneous intrusion that you can see around Mountain View Airport. I stole these maps from Orland French's book, which if you haven't read it, I would strongly advise you to get it and read it cover to cover. I've done it now twice. It's amazing. A couple of things to pick up here is that in this map here, you can see two lines going across, B to B and A to A. The first one, A to A, shows how our limestone is tilted. And this is really important. So it's higher on the Bay of Quinney Reach than it is on the South Shore and the Southwestern corner of the county, i.e. the South Shore. So it tilts down towards Lake Ontario. Very important. The other thing to notice is on this second graph here, it shows how it's been faulted. So we have multiple fault lines that go through the county. And what this does is it splits our limestone and creates crevices and layers for water to move within the geology. So that's really important because what it ends up being is that at the South Shore, we're at the lower end of the tilt and it's fractured limestone, highly fractured with these major fault lines as well as minor fault lines that give water ways to, to percolate down into the rock and move along these various fissures. This will pay, play itself out further on. So that was the, that's the bedrock that we have, this highly fractured limestone. And then we had ice. We had lots of ice. Multiple glaciations through the Pleistocene epoch, which started basically about 40,000 years ago. The ice has come forward and retreated and come forward and retreated multiple times over that period. Every time it did, 
it scraped our bedrock and any soil that was on it off. So it basically scraped the landscape clean. The other interesting part about that is that as the ice receded, the water moved out of Lake Ontario in different directions. So at some point we were a sea, at some point we were a lake, at some points we were an island surrounded by water. And this varied considerably over that 40,000 year period. So it's had a, a secondary huge impact on the landscape that we see all over Prince Edward County and in particular around the South Shore. I like the slide in the upper right hand side here because it shows a fissure within a glacier. Glaciers were not static devices. They were landscapes with their own rivers, their own uh, estuaries, their own eskers. Each part of the esker was like a living animal. And so they had different impacts on the landscape as they were moving down through the land. So that's so between the limestone being laid down, tectonic uplift, which tilted our landscape and fissured it, created fractures and, and uh, well, fractures, and then the ice, those three things have had a profound effect on the South Shore. So that, whoops, we currently end up with this, basically much of Prince Edward County is flat. The southern shore is extremely flat, but it's also fractured. So we have limestone that is highly fractured. By the time the ice left, it would have been absolutely barren rock. Perhaps some bits and pieces of gravel and cobble, but barren rock. The other part, the other neat thing about this is that ice is heavy. It's about a ton per square meter of ice. And there were upwards of two miles, oh, here I am going imperial and metric, over two kilometers, almost three kilometers thickness of ice was sitting on top of our poor fractured limestone. Needless to say, it sunk it. It sunk it to great depths, potentially 200 meters below what it currently is or more. The reason they know that is because the limestone continues to uplift as, as we go through glacial rebound, and it's still moving at about a centimeter a century. So you put 13,000 years on that, and a centimeter builds up pretty quickly to a tremendous depth that the, the rock has lifted up um, above the lake. Now, this had also a profound effect because the water moved off the land as the land lifted, all right? So we had uplift and flooding occurring at the same time. All of this changing the landscape. It also affected how the water moved out of Lake Ontario and down through the Lachine Rapids. So we have this, we ended up with uneven, an uneven area with the receding seas, lots of beachheads, frost upheaval, and eventually soil creation as the lake receded. So there's no, there's no doubt, or it's a pretty good explanation as to why there's so little soil at the South Shore, it's because it hasn't been exposed for very long. It had the rebound above the lake level before the terrestrial vegetation could even start creating soil. So here's a couple more shots that show some of those fault lines. Here's the McMahon Fault, which goes right through the South Shore at Gull Pond. And you can see the, maybe you can see it, this jagged line below it where there's uplifting and the fault line down through it. On the lower left-hand side, they have these, this, this is an example of the uplift, a local uplift. So the, you have fault lines that crack the rock and go either up or down, and you have this pushing up, I hate to say it, but it's almost like a, a zit popping when these rocks release the pressure and they create these little bubbles at the surface. They are all over the South Shore and they crack the rock and make that then a vulnerable and, and available to the, the wave action to break it up even further. 
So what did we end up with? By the time the glaciers left, we had shallow soil or no soil over fractured limestone. We had the soils that we do have tends to be either silts or clays. So a few loamy layer areas where beach fronts were reminiscent uh, in areas that were slower to rebound. It's highly flat, but remember it's tilted. So it tilts from the Northwest to the Southwest. So we end up with some areas that are wetter than others. But because it's so flat, it actually stays wet for a very long period of time in the spring. So it can be upwards of two months or longer with sitting water on top of the rock. Um, and then there are shallow wetlands. I know of areas where there's groundwater aquifers. That groundwater might be traveling from miles and miles away down through these fissures and comes up and bubbles up on the South Shore. It's very cool. These areas that are wet in the spring, because it's cracked limestone, it dries out in the summer. So it goes from soaking wet in the spring to drought prone in the summertime. The shoreline is flat and unforgiving. There are very few uh, areas where you can bring a boat in and nowhere where you can be secure from a storm event. We think there were hardwood forests eventually by the time uh, humans arrived here. There's gravel beaches. One of the great things is there's these gravel bars that are out all over the South Shore. And these were fabulous spawning shoals for herring, whitefish, lake trout, and other species. The, the habitat conditions that are currently exist in this newly formed uh, landscape are mostly alvar. So what about in indigenous use of this area? Well, the Laurentian, there's some evidence that Laurentian peoples were in this area as soon as the ice left. So anywhere between four and 12,000 years ago, they would have been more than happy to come down to the South Shore and take advantage of the fisheries in particular. They likely did not stay there because there wasn't any soil. And so these were mostly, the original ones anyways, were hunter-gatherers. There's some evidence at uh, Gull Pond, for example, where there's uh, evidence of burials of fish bones where people were actively catching fish. But it really wasn't until about 1300 BC or so until the Iroquois and the Algonquins started to live in Prince Edward County. By then, the lands would have lifted up enough. They would have had enough soil that they could start growing the three sisters, the corn, squash, and beans. They would have been, had enough trees to create their agrarian villages. And they would have been able to take advantage of the prolific fisheries that surround Prince Edward County. So here's a bit of an aside. One of the things that uh, I love this story, it's a bit of an aside. It's not the South Shore, but it's something that the county should be proud of, or we can latch on to our Mohawk friends uh, to, be, to be part of this story. So in approximately 1451, Tekanawita was born on the shores of Prince Edward, on the shores of Deserano, is where they think the shores of uh, Bay of Quinney, where his grandmother had a vision for him that he was to be the great peacemaker, peacemaker between all the Iroquois tribes. And it came to be that he was. He traveled south of the shore, south, uh, south of the lake. He met with multiple leaders and all across the Iroquois nation, um, promoting this idea of honesty, trust, caring, respect, equality, and justice as being the foundation of a confederacy that ultimately came to be. And so he was the creator of the Five Nations Confederacy and what they call the Great Law. And the Great Law is still used today and is the foundation for the Iroquois Nation. Um, and it became the foundation of the American Constitution. So I would encourage any of you or all of you to Google the great peacemaker. There's a, it's a fabulous uh, piece of our story and uh, it's part of our, our uh, native history in this area. To come back to the chaos, about 150, uh, about 1615 Champlain, French of course, came to Montreal and met some Huron chiefs. And the Huron chiefs basically said, look, we'd love to ally with you. We are a great nation, but you need to first justify 
that we that you are as great as you say you are. And in order to do that, we want you to come with us and use your guns to help us defeat the Iroquois in a great battle. Champlain, who only had about 50 people with him, was a little bit overwhelmed. He said, well, here's my chance. I'll go with them. They went down across the shore over to New York, met with a number of the Iroquois leaders. They pulled up their guns and shot them. Not a great way to start a relationship. Uh, the Iroquois at first were shocked. They pulled back because they'd never seen guns before. They regrouped and they reattacked and, and beat the Hurons back. The reason I tell you this story is because it set the tone for what would eventually become North America and Canada. If the Huron hadn't um, partnered with the French, the Iroquois wouldn't have partnered with the English. We would be a French nation rather than an English nation, I would argue. So it had a huge and profound effect on the long-term history of Canada. It also created 150 years of chaos in our area because the Indian, so-called Indian Wars went on both between the French and the English and between the Iroquois and the Hurons. And our area was right in the center of that huge battle. One of the worst ones occurred when the Hurons, who were gaining the upper hand, or always had the upper hand, went up to Midland and slaughtered a number of uh, Hurons, including the famous uh, torturing and burning of Father Brebeuf, who was eventually canonized and is now a saint. So all of that has a signature and a role in influencing how we ended up where we did. Because basically we were Huron and Iroquois, they were both here, but they were battling over our area. The Iroquois began to win, but then both the Iroquois and the Huron were decimated by disease and war. So that by the time of, <coughs> excuse me, by 1763, the, uh, both nations had pulled out of this area. Prince Edward County was basically devoid of natives in, in the late 1700s. The Mississauga nation from up around Algonquin filled the void. So they moved down here and started occupying the land uh, as nomads. They basically came down to hunt and fish and then went back north. They didn't really want to stay in an area that was so hostile. Lots of other things were going on with native uh, relationships across North America at that time. And it was actually pretty ugly. Um, ugly to the point where in 1763, there was a royal proclamation that said that basically all lands west of the Quebec border were reserved for Aboriginal peoples. The British were heavily um, involved in partnering with the natives in Canada, and they couldn't do it without them, in fact. They were worried about the Americans. They were worried about just managing the whole land. So they were recognizing the value of their partners and said, we can't keep slaughtering them and stealing their land. So. That Royal Proclamation had a huge impact and it happened, it was very timely because if it wasn't for that, the gunshot treaty would not have happened. So that happened after the US War of Independence. So as you know, the county has been or was settled by your UELs and soldiers after the American War of Independence. Um, but before they could do that, they had to basically get the land from the Mississaugis who were the nation that was occupying this land at that time. So before they could start the surveys, they had to have a treaty with them. Hence the gunshot treaty, which for those of you who don't know was crazy. It basically said that the Mississaugis would see now all lands that from, from Desert, not Deserano, um, Carrying Place, as far as a gun could be heard. The British took that to mean all the way to York. And so it wasn't until uh, they, they revisited that and realized that in, 18, in the 1800s, early 1800s, um, that that was not, no longer tenable. They had to renegotiate it. So in 1805, they renegotiated the gunshot treaty, but it still wasn't much better for the natives. Um, they basically were left on, in reserves and um, they had to cede away all of their lands, except the islands. So the islands that surrounded Prince Edward County and down to uh, Montreal were left 
to the natives except the ducks, which is still kind of weird to me that the false duck and main duck island were kept by the crown. And I'm not sure how that happened. <coughs> Excuse me. So then we had the UALs wanting to come up. The American War of Independence was, was waning or was ending. And another interesting part of the story is that in 1784, while the Mohawks, who had been great supporters of the English throughout the War of Independence, were being granted land on the, in the Grand River, in Brantford, 20 families agreed that they wanted to stay in Tyendinaga, where the great peacemaker was born. So they felt a spiritual need to stay there, hence our Mohawk tribe that is up in Deserano now. And then in 1784, our UELs landed here. They consisted of the German Brunswick, which were uh, the Germans, but they're allied to the English, uh, the British regulars, as well as other UELs who wanted to land in Prince Edward County. So that brings us up to settlement period. Now, hopefully you can see this. This is these are a couple of maps showing some of the South Shore. This is particularly Long Point. Um, from two different maps, both the original one, where you can see that John Walters owned Long Point, which is where the Bird Observatory is now, and John Walters um, owned Timber Island. Um, a few years later, Palmateer of the famous Toronto Maple Leafs goalie family, then owned Long Point. So you'll notice some of the names on there, they're very familiar county names, Ostrander, Blakely, Head, Palmateer, as I said, Ostrander, um, lots of familiar names. And the other interesting part about this is that they were all long, thin lots. Now, if you were a farmer, you would prefer to not have to walk three or four kilometers to get to the end of your property. The reason they did this was to give people access to the water and access to any roads that were to be created. So all across where the British did their surveys, they had these long, thin lots to give maximum access to road, cut, road frontage and water, which is kind of interesting in and of itself. Now here's another couple of maps showing the Ostrander and uh, Point Peter area. Again, very familiar names. Uh, you'll see there's basically just to show you that they were uh, familiar county names um, and there were relatively small lots and lots of them. Um, okay, that's all I really wanted to say about that. But one of the interesting things that I've always struggled with, and maybe you have as well, is the names of our areas. So for example, I've always called Long Point, Long Point, and been confused when people called it Prince Edward Point. Well, just to be clear, Prince Edward Point is just the point where the lighthouse is. Long Point is the entire Long Point. That is what the historic maps refer to. Point Traverse is on the northwest corner of Long Point. I didn't really know that until I looked at these maps. The other thing I falsely learned, and I use that word uh, festivity, um, is that the, the, what I learned as the false duck islands were timber and false duck. It's actually timber and sweetman island. So I was taught that this actually was False Duck Island. It's not correct. It's Sweetman Island. This is Timber Island. Together, they are the False Duck Islands. Just a little bit of uh, trivia on names. Other thing to note on this map here is that it shows where wetlands are. This is actually from a map that was drawn in 1976 by the Kingston Field Naturalist. It shows wetlands and bare land. There were no trees. Okay, so what did our poor ancestors have to deal with when they first showed up here? Well, as I said earlier, very little soil, hard to drain. It would get wet in the spring and dry out in the summer. We're pretty sure there were hardwood forests throughout it. Uh, we based that on some areas that have been pretty much left alone for 70 or 80 years and have grown into Carolinian forest uh, composition. So they have these, these relatively few areas that have been left, have got sugar maple, American beech, red oak, shagbark, hickory, and ash. Uh, that 
we think would have been the dominant forest cover when the European settlers arrived. They would have had to spend their time clearing the land, farming the land, draining the land, but mostly probably fishing because as it turned out, they couldn't get a lot of uh, farming material out of the land. They would have learned very quickly that the only crops they could really grow there were hay to feed cows and they'd have to build their own gardens. So there was very little suitable soil for uh, vegetables. They would have built their own gardens, had a small subs subsistence garden to keep them through the winter and give them some greens. Uh, but it was mostly cattle and, and hay where they could. There was enough cattle that there was a cheese factory at Point Peter. Um, but the important thing here is that isolation reigned. These people had a tough life. Uh, back in the 17, 1800s, all transportation was by water. There were no roads up there. Um, you had to rely on your neighbors to survive. You had to rely on water to get around and you had to rely on fish and your ingenuity to get through the hard times. So it's not really a surprise that some of them turned to rum running and other illegal activities or uh, other colorful activities, let me say, to get things done. Well, come 1939, by the time we got it well into the 1900s, the productivity of the land in, on the South Shore had been decimated. There was only a little bit of soil anyways. Many of the farmers were abandoning their land because they couldn't keep up. They couldn't even raise cattle properly. The, the number of cattle you could raise on an acre of land was so low that it wasn't profitable. So the lands became pretty much denuded. They had done their best to farm it and failed. The other thing that happened is that the fishery had collapsed. So the, many of the, of the landowners down there were part-time fishermen and or sailors. Um, and with the collapse of the fishery, and then there was, you know, the rum running only played out for so long. There wasn't a lot you could do to have a, a good life down there. So by the time the war came around in 39, and Canada signed on to provide the training for all the Allied um, pilots, and set up Mountain Air Force Base, they needed a, an area where they could practice bombing and practice their gunning school. So they immediately uh, purchased, and I'm sure the landowners were willing to sell their land, um, Point Petrie and Ostrander Point. So you can see here that the, uh, the price is relatively cheap. Uh, they purchased Point Petrie for 3,500 bucks. The interesting thing is we actually can't find any of the details on when they purchased Ostrander Point. We assume it was the same time period. Can't find the details on it. Uh, the original purchasing of Point Petra was just for lots 17 and 19. After the end of the First World War, they expanded that by buying 10 more lots for $58,000. So they were slowly expanding their ownership of the lands down at the South Shore, both at Ostrander and Ostrander, I should say, and Point Petrie. I should have also said instead of not just the, the names of the places, the pronunciation of the places. I got it stuck in my head early on that it was Ostrander and Point Peter, and many a local will say it's Point Petrie and Ostrander. So I'm trying to reteach myself to pronounce them in that way. And I'll continue to work on that. Basically, so the, uh, during the time of the National Department of Defense owning a large chunk of the South Shore, let's just say they weren't the best caretakers of the land. They received it in pretty much a denuded state, i.e. no trees, bare rock wherever they could. Some drainage had been done the military did a lot more drainage. They brought their bulldozers in and drained a lot more of the land. They're only scraping away anywhere from eight to 10 inches of broken rock, but they wanted to have full access. They wanted areas to be even drier. 
So they created many more ditches in the area. So that by the end of 69, in the mid 60s, it was basically a denuded landscape. Uh, by the time the national defense was done bombing, strafing, scraping, uh, cutting down whatever was in the way, it was pretty much devoid of vegetation. So that brings us to the 60s. Now the 60s is where the story starts to take an interesting twist. We had hippies emerging all over the place. We had Rachel Carson and her Silent Spring, which was a springboard for environmental concerns all across North America. We had Bob Dylan and his The Times They Are a Changing songs happening. People were starting to understand that we can't continue to rape and pillage the landscape without serious impacts to ourselves and our biodiversity, although they didn't call it that back then. So a couple of really interesting things happened that affected the South Shore. The first was the passing of the Agricultural Rehabilitation and Development Directorate Act, or ARDA. That was passed in 1969. Now this is a piece of provincial legislation that they basically set up an arm's length uh, organization to obtain and manage dysfunctional land across Ontario. So these were lands that had been attempted to be farmed and had failed miserably and they were now in a dilapidated state. And this organization was given money to purchase them and then to enter into agreements to try to restore them. You have to remember at this time also, we had lots of flooding still going on. It was just after Hurricane Hazel, conservation authorities were just getting started. Uh, there was lots of activity to try to restore the land. An equally important thing, I believe, was that an American, Charles Hershey from Carthage, New York, purchased Long Point, a large part of Long Point in 1956, and allowed it, he was a absentee owner. He would receive rental fees from the fishermen who lived in, or who rented his huts in the, the harbor at Long Point, but he didn't spend a lot of time here. And he started to have ideas of creating a fishing camp on the South Shore at Long Point. And he started to discuss this with people and try to get partners and people interested in the idea. And, and, it, and it started to hit the wrong spot on a few people. Long Point in the 1960s was in rough shape. This photograph uh, was taken in 1969, I believe, and it shows a few trees, those trees, where there are trees, it's wetland basically, and nothing else. But despite that, there was still ample wildlife. It was widely being used for hunting. Slaughtering is a better way to describe it because there was very little enforcement in this area. Uh, there was lots of fishing going on and to what degree it was regulated is debatable. It was party central. It was a long way away from Picton and people were camping and putting up camper trailers and staying down at Long Point and partying for long periods of time. It was in really rough shape. So it's not a surprise that he actually wanted to develop the land and make some good use for it. Except the Canadian, oh, sorry, the Kingston Field Naturalists got wind of this. And in particular, a Dr. Ron Weir, who was a very recent, he might even still been in graduate school at this time. Uh, he was a, either a young professor or in graduate school at Queens, taking an engineering degree, but he was a passionate birder. And he got wind of this development and him and his friends had been spending some time at Long Point and had observed that there were, even with all of the stuff going on, considerable numbers of birds there. And they decided to actually in the late 60s, I think it was 68 or 69, go out there in the fall and do a bird count. Sort of what we do for the Christmas bird count, I think. And they saw phenomenal numbers and species of birds. From that, they decided to set up the first birding, uh, uh, I was going to say fact, the, the tagging, the bird tagging there. They used the old lighthouse to begin annual migration surveys and tagging surveys of the birds that were using the South Shore. 
And they started to document all kinds of biodiversity, including hawks and owls and, and all kinds of rare species. And what I find most staggering is that every fall they would count anywhere, but the lowest number was 50,000, upwards of 100,000 scop. Ron, I was talking to Ron about this a couple of weeks ago, and he said that it would sound like thunder when the scop left the water. There were that many of them. So when we see our rafts of three to 5,000 scop now, that's nothing compared to what there was in the late seven or in the early 70s. Well, this went on. They did their surveys for five years. And then Mr. Herschel actually approached what they said was Prince Edward County Council. I suspect it was the South Marysburg Council. They got approval for their development. So they got first cut approval to build this resort at Long Point, as well as an airport that they were going to build to bring in their rich fishing friends and hunting friends. Well, that was the last straw. The Kingston Field Naturalist put together a phenomenal document that summarized all of their work for the last six years, as well as all the bad things they had observed at Long Point, and petitioned the, the uh, uh, Canadian Wildlife Service to create the National Wildlife Area. And they did such a fabulous job that in 1978 it was created. But it was all because of Dr. Ron Weir and his colleagues who did this work and documented all of this amazing data so that the Canadian Wildlife Service basically couldn't say no. They did a phenomenal job. So the early protection on Prince Edward County started with them. Now to come back to Arda. It was equally bizarre. Um, so here's a, a perfect story in government chaos. So try to follow me on this. The provincial government gave $202,000 to Arda to purchase the lands off the federal government who had already purchased the lands. The Ministry of Natural Resources, which was the back then lands and forest, then applied to Arda to manage the lands on their behalf and won the contract. And I'm not sure if they got money to do this. It's a little vague as to what actually happened in this circular relationship. All we do know is that Lands and Forest and eventually m &R agreed to manage Point Peter or Point Petra, not Ostrander. Ostrander is off in no man's land at this point. Um, but they came up with a phenomenal uh, vision for the area. So I'm going to read it to you. The goal was to enhance and maintain the recreational variety and opportunity supplied by the ecological, cultural, and historical features of the county, its provincial parks, and managing it, management areas by returning it to its natural state, allowing for wildlife viewing, walking trails, and hunting opportunities. When the South Shore Joint Initiative developed their independent goal, the South Shore, it sounded very similar to that. So a little bit of a circular thing. So the other bizarre thing about this is that the Crown had purchased Point Petra. It's not sure when they got Ostrander Point. All we know for sure is that sometime during the tribunal for the Green Energy Act, Arda gave the ownership to MNR. So somewhere along the line, either the paperwork was lost, it never happened, nobody seems to really know. But as far as they could tell, as far as the paper trail is concerned, Ostrander Point was still in the ownership, the paper ownership of Arda, even though it hadn't been operable for many decades. This is a little bit of a bizarre government twist. Having said that, I do a lot of asides, it seems. What they, what they actually purchased was a denuded landscape. These aerial photo images show very few trees. Those single blotches are individual trees on the landscapes at Point Petra. Um, you can also see a landing, a launch pad, which is still there. Some derricks, they're still there. Uh, there's still bits and pieces of the old military establishment at Point Petra now. 
So then what I call the M&R golden years. This is when I spent my time at M&R or my best years at M&R as well. During those golden years, M&R actually followed up on what they had promised to do for Point Petra. They developed a management plan. They did habitat surveys and wildlife surveys, biodiversity surveys. All of this data is at the M&R Kingston office. They also did habitat management where they plowed and planted trees, thousands of trees. They went into a partnership with Ducks Unlimited and they, and they built two ponds, which are still operable and managed by DU today. Um, they did some weird things as well. They were creating wildlife habitat for sharp tail grouse and ring net pheasants, which they released on the property. Uh, luckily, they all died. You know, this, is, this was the time when we didn't really understand native species versus hunting opportunities. And why not have sharp tailed grouse, which are found up in the boreal forest down in Prince Edward County? So lots of strange things, but lots of very good things too. They planted lots and lots of trees and shrubs, most of which probably died. And those of you who have been to that area know that there's lots and lots of uh, tag, alder, tag alder, alder, ash, and red cedar, which are uh, species that are the pioneer species. And because there's so little soil, no matter what m &R did, they really couldn't uh, prevent these pioneer species from basically taking over. And they've continued to do so to this day. So here's a map showing part of the uh, MNR management plan that they had for the area. And there's the Ducks Unlimited dams that they built. And those two ponds are still operable. Gull Pond is here and it's still fully functional as a wildlife area. Uh, they show this as an intermittent stream on the upper side coming in the Gull the, the first DU dam. This is a large river. It's interesting that they showed it as, as uh, intermittent back in the 60s. It rarely dries up now. Uh, and that might be because there's more vegetation on the land. Um, but that's basically what they purchased. And as I said, at some point, MNR started managing Ostrander Point without having full authority to do so. And there's a picture that taken during the bio blitz of uh, the first DU pond. Okay, so that's where we were back up to about 95, the end of an era. Those of you who may remember in 1995, we had an election. I'm retired now, so I can say this. A certain Mr. Harris, who is now receiving a Governor General's Award, became our Premier. And m &R went into a long period of constraint, shall we say. And so all of the monies available for wildlife management disappeared. And m &R to the, they also got reorganized multiple times. And throughout all of this time, m &R maintained the ownership of these crown lands and did their best to continue to manage them. So when they had a technician available, they would do road management. They would come and do garbage pickups. They would send their game wardens to do enforcement uh, to make sure that there wasn't too much, <coughs> excuse me, too much poaching going on. Hmm. Forest succession was continuing. I call it the invasion of red cedar. It's not really more of an invasion. It's just a pioneer species uh, that has dominated this area. It does very well in fractured limestone. They love disturbed conditions as does poison ivy, and there's lots of both of them in, across this whole area. But during the constraint period, a couple of other things have occurred that have had a continuing impact on the South Shore. And that is that ATVs became a very popular mode of transportation and recreational activity. And so they have been utilizing the South Shore, uh, including myself, uh, down there, having lots of fun roaring around on these wet, shallow, rocky areas. It's a lot of fun to ride around on your ATVs. There's also been a lot of camping um, down in the South Shore. It's very quiet, uh, very peaceful. And a lot of people have taken advantage of camping in these areas, even though you're not supposed to. 
So a lot of things have changed since the 60s when these lands were purchased for restoration. You can see from both of these aerial images, it's now dominated by green. So it's largely green. It may not be the kinds of trees you want, but it's green. Lots of green in this area. There's still lots of wetlands. You can see the big DU pond here in this picture. And here's the other one. And remarkably, through our bio blitzes, the biodiversity has recovered. It behooves me to understand where they were or how they survived the dark years during the military times and during the periods where there's almost no vegetation, but there are, or there continue to be, uh, blandish turtles, least bitterns, all kinds of herons and osprey and all kinds of birds that have continued to live in this area and have expanded. I mean, it's interesting to think that the age of a Blanding's turtle being upwards of 100 years, they would have had to have survived. Some of these older ones have survived through all of these eras and are now seeing the restored environment. I think that's a little exciting that they are more resilient than we think of. But it has left some scars on the landscape. The habitat has been tremendously impacted. Uh, here's some slides that I took during one of our Peckfin uh, stream surveys in the springtime showing what should be streams, but they are actually roadways. So because it is this fractured limestone with shallow broken till on top of it, the water will travel wherever it can. And whether it's trucks, or purposely drained sections of the river. Most of the rivers on this landscape now are straight and follow patterns of disturbances, whether it's four-wheeler trails or tractors or whatever. So they, the, the efforts that man has put forward to uh, control drainage on the South Shore have had a huge effect on the drainage in this area. And these, as I said, are just a few slides of, uh, of how impacted the drainage patterns of the South Shore are. There's also been other damages. Um, there's been fires. There's continue to be dumps. People are continuing to camp in this area. And there's still lots of AT work or ATVs that are um, causing damages to both roadways and also travel routes. And there's been some soil stripping as well. Um, so the damage has been extensive. And then there was the GEA. So I should also add to that, having said all of that, Long Point has fared much better. Because it was taken over by the feds, and they have controlled access at that location. It's a national wildlife area. There's no hunting there and there's controlled access. There has been much less damage to the infrastructure of Long Point, or rather it's had a better chance to return or rehabilitate itself. So now coming back to the GEA, started on Old Strander. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Peckman was a major impact as to why Old Strander won. Um, but at Old Strander, they, there were all kinds of weird things that came up, as in, D&D admitted there were still unexploded ordinances there during the the uh, whole Ostrander Point fiasco. They went there and did surveys because they basically said we, it's too dangerous to build turbines here because there's still unexploded bombs. And so they did their surveys. I don't know what they found. I hope they didn't find any, but they built more swaths more disturbances where they annihilated the current vegetation and are allowing it to grow back yet again. On a positive side, it reinvigorated the interest of the county and all of Southern Ontario on the South Shore. If it weren't for the Green Energy Act, I would argue, we might be still stumbling along without a major effort to protect the rest of the South Shore. So that's the positive side. It facilitated a whole bunch of surveys. We've been doing our bio blitzes down there for the last several years. 
and it reawakened the community to the importance of this area and carried on the efforts of the Kingston Field Naturalist. That's the thing that I think is most exciting. The Kingston Field Naturalist started it for us in the late 60s. And Prince Edward County and Peckfin and South Shore Joint Initiative and the rest of the organizations have picked up the hammer and we're carrying it forward to try to protect the South Shore. And uh, this picture on the lower right hand side was actually a very, very old landings turtle that we saw during one of our, our uh, stream surveys that Peckfin sponsored uh, four or five years ago uh, to document these drainage areas. And this one might have been 70 or 80 years old. She was beautiful and she was alive and that was fabulous. So there's been a lot of movement and a lot of things happened in a very short period of time. And I stole this slide from uh, the Nature Conservancy. I don't know if Mark Stab is on this call or not, but I stole his slide from it. And then I colored in a new blot because they didn't have McMahon Bluff on theirs. So we've had so much progress in the last few years in purchasing new lands, in moving towards this uh, crown block management plan for Ostrander and Point Petra that South Shore Joint Initiative is listening is uh, leading. Uh, Timber Island is now a provincial park. Ducks Unlimited has got properties. You can see how much of the South Shore is now in some form of a protected state and efforts are continuing to improve the habitats that were so denuded through our ignorance, I guess. So in conclusion, uh, the South Shore is special. We knew that. We know that it's a very sensitive alvar habitat. We're now getting a better understanding of the role that geology is playing in that sensitivity and how new those habitats are. Um, the federal lands are bouncing back thanks to Kingston Field Naturalist. Humans have been using these areas for thousands of years, maybe not doing a lot of farming, but that's because of geology. And uh, during the Anthropocene era, we have done a lot of very bad things to the South Shore, but we're starting to turn the tide on that and starting to allow the habitats to come back. And, and um, that's a very good thing. The other thing is, we are continuing a legacy that started out in 69. We are carrying on Rachel Carson's dream of mobilizing communities to protect and understand um, important habitats. And with that, I'd like to end the talk and acknowledge all the people that I stole information from, particularly the books, uh, Steve Campbell's book in particular, and Janet Davies and Ian Robertson's an illustrated history of Prince Edward County. I won't read them all. I really want to mention Dr. Ron Weir. He was a, a total inspiration and, and uh, he reached out to me. I'm not even sure how old he is now, but uh, he was very forthcoming in giving me all kinds of information. Orlin French's book is fabulous. I'd encourage you to read that if you can. Andy Markinson provided all of the information on Point Petra and Ostrander Point. Um, and Molly McGowan, uh, the archivist at Prince Edward County Public Library was very helpful as well in providing the maps. And I wanna again, thank South Shore and Peckfin for all their work and, and support and all the pictures they provided. Thank you. So thank you, Les, this is Jerry uh, speaking. Thank you so much. Um, I'll thank you more formally in a minute, but I'm just looking for questions. And I don't see any, but any, because people must have been so um, engaged. Underwhelmed. And that's good. Um, <laughs> now, no, Les, could you stop, so. Les, could you stop sharing your screen? Would that be okay? Oh, that would work. Okay. Maybe, yes, I can. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So let's, uh, I'm going to thank you on behalf of all of us um, for a really wonderful talk. 
Uh, you shared so much with us, so much knowledge and breadth and depth and your passion for the South Shore. And um, it's really uh, a great thing to behold. I should tell you that we have 57 participants this evening, oh, wow. which is actually double what we've had on, <laughs> on uh, any other of our Zoom calls. And uh, that certainly speaks to the interest in the South Shore that so many organizations and so many individuals have uh, encouraged and, and engendered. Um, and thank you also for allowing us to record tonight because there was so much in your presentation. I, I understand you told me, in fact, that you had added some slides um, and it all worked marvelously, but it's a lot of information and we will be able to view it again on the South Shore Joint Initiatives YouTube channel and somewhere else. Amy, you, want, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I did. There does look like there's one question. Amy? So there is, does oh, seem, okay. looking through the chat, that there's oh. one from Alex Bowling. <clears throat> so it says, I'm curious about the role reality of Point Petra, or Peter, <laughs> and DND communication array. Can you speak to that? Is there anything to speak to? I think you mean the existing one that is there? Yes, they have maintained that. I can't remember how many hectares it is. Yeah. Uh, there is a chunk of land that is still federal land down at Point Petra. And uh, they maintain it for a, a weather station and communication. I don't know how big it is. Does anybody else know? It's like five acres or so. Terry might know. Yeah. Yeah. About five acres. Terry? Yeah, it's about five acres, I think. And the other thing you should do, uh, Les, oopsie. Les, there are about a thousand thank yous for you in the chat. Oh, I see them. Thank you. You're very welcome. My pleasure. Myrna, I see you've got a question. No, I wanted to say thank you. Oh. And, and how much I learned from your presentation about the South Shore. How could you learn? Um, You've been around forever. Oh my God. That's, I'm seeing some of the faces on here that are my gurus. And I'm like, oh my God, this is crazy. You know, next to the DND land on Point Peter, we were always told that was owned by um, Environment Canada. Well, it's it is federal, so the Environment yeah. Canada has a presence there. Yeah, it's it's federal land. Yeah, as far as, far as I know. So to wrap up, thank you once again. Um, I think we'll all look forward to seeing you again on YouTube, and to show our appreciation, we have a little gift for you. Um, which I will drop off in the next few days. And There's, from the bottom of our hearts, Les, thank you so much. There is one more question, Jerry, from Michael. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, do you want to read it? It says, what do you think the new designation for the land by the province means? Um, so the province... Uh, they haven't designated the land yet. I think they've agreed to go into uh, negotiations to redesignate the land. So it's a process that they're going through. And basically, if it is successful, it will, it will accomplish the goals that were set in 1969, and it would protect the land from all future development. So infrastructure development. But they, it has to be approved yet. So South Shore Joint Initiative. Is John Hirsch still on the presentation? Um, he could give us an update on where they are in that um, public consultation. 
I guess John isn't, but Les, it would be a conservation district is what they're aiming for. Right. Well, that's different than what I heard. Okay, Myrna? It has a- Myrna, do you have a question? The process has not actually started yet. Right. But um, eventually we hope to um, agree with the province about um, what kind of activities would be allowed on the South Shore. That is our goal. Okay. Okay. Well, I think we're done. Amy, you wanted to, um, to make an announcement, Amy. Hello, Amy? She's muted. Okay, so... Oh, sorry about that, I was muted. Um, oh. You were... Pro okay. There's been some great... Um... You have an announcement. Okay, oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Les, why don't you say your comment and then I'll close up the meeting. Okay, I was just going to say, for those of you who have been following along in the chat box, there's been some great discussion um, correcting me on my, uh, my ignorance of Native culture and history. Um, apparently, I've been using some inaccurate words to describe the uh, Confederacy. Um, in, all def in my defense, I got that from a book. So <laughs> that means the book was wrong. Um, anyways, I stand corrected. Okay. Well, Les, that was terrific. I, I enjoyed it. And you did add some information as you told me you had even a second time and I'll enjoy watching the recording. And I want to thank you all for coming and for being so patient while we figured out Zoom and sat through the AGM when I forgot to have the votes. And it's just been a pleasure to see everyone. It actually feels like I'm with a crowd because you can see these faces and everything. So I hope you all feel that way too. And I want to remind you that our next meeting is on February 23rd. And we'll have Jeff Bowman back to speak on Flying Squirrels, which should be terrific. He's also been showing, if people have been following uh, the nature of things, there's been a whole series on winter and um, his <clears throat> research has been mentioned on flying squirrels in particular. Um, and I wanna remind people to please email sightings to Peckfen or to Sheila. I did put up those email addresses and if other news that you want us to uh, report, please send it to us and we'll try to get it out to the membership. Okay, so with that, I think we'll end the meeting. Thank you all for coming. Les, that was just terrific. Thank you very, very much. And thank you to the whole crew of people who have supported this, Jerry and uh, Sheila and Sheena and Sandra. And it's just been really appreciated. Okay, take care, everyone. Good night. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah.